Good morning and welcome. Today we'll hear our argument in the case of Ag Processing, Inc., a cooperative petition for declaratory order. This case involves a petition for declaratory order filed by Ag Processing challenging the reasonableness of a Norfolk Southern tariff. Subsequently, Bungie North America, Archer Daniels Midland, Louis Dreyfus, Purdue Agribusiness joined the petition. At issue is the tariff's imposition of charges and penalties on loaded cars that exceed an individual car's weight limit because of weather conditions encountered after the cars are delivered to NS. In an effort to move things along, the board members will not be making opening remarks this morning, but I wanted to cover a few procedural matters before we begin. We have asked each party to make a short statement of its argument. The council should be prepared to answer questions from the board at any time during your allotted time. I assure you that we have read all of your pleadings and there is no reason to repeat every argument. I should point out that due to a different camera configuration in the hearing room today, we have relocated the podium for speakers to the side of the front room, but otherwise are following our usual procedures. Any party making a PowerPoint presentation or using a slide deck will need to identify the party from whom the slide deck is being presented. Each party will first have 20 minutes in open session to the public. At the conclusion of that portion, we will take a brief recess of approximately five minutes. The board hearing room will be cleared and the legal representatives arguing on behalf of the parties will conduct an additional five minutes each of oral argument on matters that refer to confidential information. This portion will not be broadcast and a transcript of those remarks will be retained in the board's confidential records, but will not be posted on the board's website. As the party following the request for declaratory order, Ag Processing will open with the allotted 20 minutes. Ag Processing has reserved seven minutes for rebuttal and then we'll have, I guess, 13 minutes. I mean, we'll start with 13 minutes and then, oh, anyhow. So we'll begin with Ag Processing with their 13 minutes. Mr. Goldstein, you've argued here before. You're familiar with the red, yellow, and green lights? Very well, sir. Okay. Good morning, Chairman Elliott, Vice Chairman Begaman, and Commissioner Mulvey. I'm Andrew Goldstein and I represent the petitioners. Sitting to my right today are Greg Twist of Ag Processing, Daryl Wallace of Bungie, Lorraine Hawley of ADM, and Sue Lyons of Louis-Dreyfus Corporation. And at council table is my partner, John Cutler. The issue of whether a railroad can compel a shipper to remove snow and ice that accumulates on a car while in carrier possession is an important one. Some of the petitioner's representatives sitting here today have traveled halfway across the country because of the potential implications of this case to their businesses and to practices throughout the railroad industry. You may well hear shortly from NS a claim that its tariffs have always provided for the assessment of overload charges and penalties due to snow and ice. We dispute that for the obvious reason that NS would not have had to amend its tariff to add the words attributable to weather conditions as part of the definition of overloaded and to add a new section D explaining that rain, snow, and ice are the weather conditions that would make a car overloaded. Mr. Bernstein, couldn't, as NS explained in their brief, couldn't that creation of this tariff that's at dispute here, a provision in the tariff, have been created as a safe harbor due to the, as they claim, due to the harsh weather conditions that were expected that winter? Wouldn't that make certain sense? Well, I don't know that it really is a safe harbor. 
if you read it closely, you read the first edition of the tariff that came out, the safe harbor was there for five days, and the possible penalties could be alleviated if snow and ice were melted by natural events. When you look at the current version of the tariff, that language has been removed, and instead the tariff says that you have to, within five days, remove the lading or otherwise clear the car at your own expense. Now, I assume that if we're going to rely on warm sunshine, that's not at our own expense. So I think that the current tariff doesn't really provide a safe harbor that is really worth anything if you consider the cost of having to go into a car and clean out lading that is in there, and then what do you do? You have a contract with your customer. You're supposed to ship a car load of stuff. You can't anymore. You have to get it there some other way. You're facing a claim for breach of contract. So we don't really look upon this as a safe harbor. Could the tariff be considered, the language you spoke just about a moment ago, be considered a clarification? I mean, Norfolk Southern has always had in its tariffs, like for coal and coke, a provision for any overweight, regardless of the cause, bearing a penalty. This could be interpreted, as the way you said it, as a clarification. When we talk about overweight, we don't just mean overloaded, but also any extra weight caused by weather conditions. Would that be a possible interpretation of what they were doing in their tariff? Well, I think that's what they are doing. I think they are saying that snow and ice have to be added to the weight of the car. Our position, of course, is different. Well, I'm saying that there was always their intent, but they're just doing a clarification now because, you know, maybe snow and ice was not considered the same as just overloading the car, but since snow and ice does add to the weight of the car, then therefore that should be known by shippers. That's something that needs to be considered in determining a car's weight. Well, I mean, I don't see why, if snow and ice, in their opinion, was always to be included, it was necessary for them to amend their tariff to specifically put it in. I think the fact that they did specifically put it in suggests that this is a new item for the shippers to worry about. As opposed to just a clarification of the existing rule. Right. We think the existing rule didn't include snow and ice. Yes, sir. Thank you. Did you ever, Mr. Goldstein, do any, I guess, research with some of your clients, maybe some that have open cars that may have been affected by weather, if they had ever had cars pulled out of service because of weather? Well, we are aware of the fact that open cars are susceptible to snow dropping in, and as you know, it will then seep into that lading and it will freeze. And once it freezes, it's not going to thaw out for a while. You can't handle it manually. And we are very much aware of that, even though very few of our cars are open. In fact, maybe of the petitioners here, none. I believe they all operate tank cars and covered hopper cars. Are you aware of any situations where an open car has been pulled out due to weather because it was overloaded? No. No, sir. And that, of course, gets to the next point we were going to make, which is that an overload can only occur when the shipper loads the car. And the NS interpretation of the term overload, we think, is a misuse of the word because a car can't be overloaded unless it's loaded first. And loading requires the shipper to place goods in the car. So snow and ice that descends from the heavens and is not placed in the car as a load cannot rationally be viewed as a shipper overload. I just want to briefly point out that there are some serious consequences that attach to the NS position, which I mentioned a moment ago in terms of the shipper not being able to meet his contract of sale to a customer if a car is parked due to a snowstorm. Now, the second question, I think we've covered the first one. The second question you have is how frequently closed covered hopper cars and tank cars are made overweight by snow and ice and how those cars have been brought into compliance in the past. 
it's extremely appropriate that the board has recognized the distinction between closed tank cars and covered hopper cars on the one hand and all other types of cars which are essentially open cars with respect to snow and ice. NS itself asserts at page 8 of its motion to dismiss that weather overloads are not typically experienced by tank cars and covered hopper cars. And petitioners have no way of determining how often covered hopper cars are made overweight by snow and ice while in the position of NS or other carriers. And the reason for that is twofold. Carriers don't report those events publicly, and NS has certain relevant policies that it treats as highly confidential and which I understand we'll discuss at a closed session. This question actually raises a very interesting issue, which is that the problem of overweight cars does not involve tank cars and, and uh, covered hopper cars. And this conclusion is supported by a statement at page 10 of the NS motion to dismiss, where NS asserts, quote, petitioners know the commodity, their commodities and the commodities properties for absorbing moisture, close quote. Of course, there's never been any indication that snow or ice is absorbed by the properties of lading in a fully enclosed tank or covered hopper car. Lading with absorption property, as you noted, is that which is in open cars. So we feel that if NS is having problems with those types of cars, it should have directed this tariff in that direction and, and not uh, to, to covered hopper cars and tank cars. Have any shippers been underloading their cars in response to this tariff that, that you're aware of? Have the shippers been responding, saying that, well, we have to be careful now, so we're going to uh, put 6,000 pounds less in the car in case it goes, uh, in case it cars. Yes, sir. Two inches of ice over it. Yes, sir. The answer to your question is yes. Uh, the May shippers have uh, scales at their facilities, mm -hmm. and when a car comes in to be loaded, the gross a permissible weight is stenciled on the side of the car. The car is put on the scale empty. The, uh, the result of that tells the shipper how much snow and ice is on top of the car in terms of weight because that's the difference between the, 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 the tear weight and, 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 and what the scale weight shows. And then the shippers subtract that amount from the lading that they put in the car. And they have been doing that then? They have. Okay. They have. And you're saying that, that occurs when you're presented with a car with snow and ice on it? That's right. That's right. Now, I mean, there, there are some small elevators that don't have these scales. But we're, for, for the, the most part, for the most part, uh, uh, the elevators do. And what they do when they load a car is they use a matrix, which tells them, in essence, how high in the car they can load before running into a, uh, an overweight problem. Could you clarify something for me? I guess I'm a bit confused on how they know. How is it just to underload it by, say, the 5,000 pounds? Because if it's a huge snowstorm, you know, ultimately there could be 8,000 pounds of snow on the car. Is the shipper not penalized for that? Well, if it's, over, it's overweight. Yeah, if, if, the, if the shipper can only deal with what is on the car when the car is at his facility for loading. Once that, once that car goes and more snow and ice is added, we don't feel that that's, that's a load or an overload or our problem. But the tariff seems to imply that it is. Yes, ma'am, it does. So you're saying that in anticipation, the, the shippers are not anticipating problems down the road. In other words, the weather forecast that there's going to be heavy snows in Iowa and the uh, car is going to, through Iowa and maybe go to a, a yard in Iowa, uh, and that you might, the shipper might know that there's a snowstorm heading there and that would add weight. But my question was, the shippers are not anticipating that there be an accumulation of more snow and ice after the car has been loaded and therefore uh, under loading it to account for the possibility that ultimately it will get heavier. Yes, that was uh, actually an issue I was going to address, and, and uh, uh, let, me, let me skip over to it now. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the problem is that the shippers can't predict 
where their cars will be and when they will be there. Uh, and uh, aside from the fact that all of us know just how reliable weather forecasts are on the radio. Um, but the, the shippers have no way of telling when, when their car is going to hit some point where there might be a snowstorm. They don't want to just shut down loading cars because there's some prediction of what's going on. If they had the, the, uh, the power, which they don't, to determine what route on the NS system the cars would follow, you know, they might be able to route the cars around the storm. We don't have that power. NS does. And uh, uh, I, I'd just like to, to read a, a short quotation from the, from the board and docket 42068, upholding an argument made by NS. Uh, quote, given the many variables outside a railroad's control that may affect delivery, a railroad generally cannot be expected to deliver cars at the same time every day, close quote. In other words, the board concluded at NS's urging that rail service is inherently unreliable. And in docket 4200, uh, can I just uh, intrude on my own? Uh, thank you. Uh, in docket 42060 sub 1, another class 1 railroad successfully asserted that, quote, service var variability is a necessary part of rail service to and from many shipper locations, close quote, citing the NS argument in docket 42068. So we think that, that the NS itself has clearly established that there's no way that, that we can predict when our cars are going to be someplace where snow is, is going to fall. And, and with that, I'd like to reserve the rest of my time. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Goldstein. Now we'll hear from Norfolk Southern. Uh, Mr. Wimbish, you have 20 minutes. Chairman Elliott, Vice Chairman Begeman, and Commissioner Mulvey, good morning. I am Rob Wimbish, and here with me today from Norfolk Southern at the table, General Solicitor Greg Summey, uh, Assistant Vice President of Customer Service Rush Bailey, and at the seats behind, uh, Attorney Christy Friedman. At issue here today is whether Norfolk Southern's tariff governing overloaded rail cars is reasonable. The record in our presentation today will show that the tariff is eminently reasonable and that the agricultural shippers involved in this proceeding have not proven and indeed cannot prove that the tariff is unreasonable. Now, there are four points I would like to express this morning that are very important for the board's consideration. The first one is that the complainants are responsible for proving that the complained of tariff is unreasonable. The second, is that the complainants have not met their burden of proof here. The third, that overloaded cars are unsafe, costly to the railroad, and interfere with normal operations. And finally, that it is reasonable to expect a shipper to exercise due diligence and prudent foresight to avoid an unsafe situation, including unsafe car loading. In the process, I hope to address the four questions that were presented and the board's order establishing oral argument. I would like first to address the appropriate legal standard. First, as a threshold matter, this matter was presented as a petition for declaratory order. A declaratory order proceeding is appropriate where a genuine case or controversy exists. And because the complainants here have not provided facts to demonstrate an injury or even the likelihood of injury, under the revised tariff, we believe that they have not adequately provided a basis for board issuance of a declaratory order. That said, the complainants alleging an unreasonable practice must prove on the basis of case-specific facts that the complained of practice is unreasonable. This is fundamental. The complainants must prove based on facts that the, content, the, the complained of practice does not comport with the board standards for unreasonable practices. In that regard, another very important consideration. It is important for the board to remember that in, under the unreasonable practice standards, Norfolk Southern's tariff need not be perfect, or even better than other alternatives, 
the standard is only whether or not the complaint of tariff is actually reasonable. And in that regard, I would like to point out that roughly six months ago, the board pointed out in another rate unreasonableness challenge that the board stated that its role in such cases and under the Interstate Commerce Act is not to micromanage the railroad industry. Now, in light of the applicable legal standard, complainants simply have not proven here that the tariff is unreasonable, and they offer no facts to show that they incur an unfair burden or any burden under the tariff. Let's consider three important facts. Can I ask a question? Sure. How does a shipper get to the overweight car that is now pulled aside because of the weight and snow? Let's say it's 400 miles away from where they first gave you the car. There's a huge snowstorm. How do they get there within their five days to take care of this problem? And I also would like you to clarify, I think your first sentence, you said that this is a tariff governing overloaded rail cars. Now, I didn't get a sense from Mr. Goldstein that they believe they should be able to overload their cars. I don't think there's any dispute that they shouldn't go over the limit, the allowable limit. So maybe you could help clarify overloading versus perhaps what happens after it has been loaded. Sure, Vice Chairman. There were two questions. I think the first question was what does a shipper do when it is alerted to the existence of an overloaded car? Well, how practically do they get there to shovel off the car or remove the loading when it's a huge snowstorm and you have five days? Normally, if a car is detected as being overloaded in transit, I think I'd like to stress, first of all, that the record so far here is reflected, and the Board had asked a question during the initial presentation of how often agricultural cars become overloaded. And I think it's important, and I will get to this again in a moment, that that simply is not happening. But that said, to the practice of it, where a car is detected en route as being overloaded, the shipper will be alerted. In most cases, in my understanding, what happens is the shipper invariably contracts with a contractor who is experienced with offloading an amount of that commodity that is inside the car. The portion of the load that may be in excess of the weight is either transferred to a truck and then shipped off to another location, or it may be loaded into another rail car. And how did – what was your tariff prior, and what was the practice prior to this new tariff? Was it an essence responsibility? Same. No, it was the same. It was the exact same. So there – it was the exact same? Yes. So then what's the difference between the old tariff and the new tariff, if it's exactly the same? The difference between the old tariff and the new tariff is that, as Mr. Goldstein pointed out – I don't mean the amended one, but like previous – many years ago. Okay, between the old tariff and tariffs before that? Well, you know, not the tariff that was originally the subject of this declaratory order that was then subsequently amended about a month later, but prior to July of 2010 or June when that tariff about – Right, under the original tariff before any of these changes from the summer of 2010. Yes. In that case, the practice would have been exactly the same. If the car had been detected as overweight – and this gets to the second part of your question of how we define overloaded, whether or not that's a verb, an adjective, a noun. For us, any car that exceeds the maximum weight limits is an overloaded car by our definitions. Those shippers who have encountered overloaded cars are aware of that definition. Now, the agricultural shippers would claim that this is something brand new, and it may be because in their experience they do not encounter overloaded cars and therefore have not been aware of this longstanding definition of ours. Our record establishes that this has been the longstanding Norfolk Southern policy. Those handful of shippers that have experienced weather-related overloads are aware of that situation and comport themselves appropriately. They take appropriate steps where necessary. The fact that they weren't aware of it doesn't mean it's not new. It may be new to them, but it isn't new to affected shippers. And is this portion of the tariff concerning the overload similar to how you treat coal? No, actually the coal and coke provisions are actually much more stringent. So, I mean, they're obviously not an issue here. Is it the shipper's responsibility to unload and to shovel? If appropriate, but again there I think that you'd have to look at whether or not under the circumstances the tariff is imposing unfair restrictions or conditions on shippers, including coal shippers. They're not here complaining about their provisions, and I think that they work adequately under the circumstances. So it would be tough for me to presume that in light of a more strict condition or circumstance that the coal or coke shippers are subjected to an unreasonable practice themselves. The problem with overloaded cars in part is a safety one. Now, 
cost today able to handle 143 tons, 26,000 pounds. And um, that's usually considered to be what the what the right of way can support. But is there any leeway? Is there any variance in that? In other words, uh, is the is the infrastructure really capable of handling uh, costs that? 286 plus or minus some amount, or is 286 the maximum the maximum threshold that the infrastructure can handle? In other words, the, the overloaded cars really do damage if the overload is only say three or four percent of what the of what the track is classified to handle. Well, the answer is in some cases uh, tracks are capable of withstanding additional weights above and beyond the maximum you've listed. But you've also hit on an important point that the most significant element, there are really two significant elements to the overload provisions, and I don't want them to be lost on the board today. One of them is that it is inherently a safety issue. An overloaded car p p places uh, considerable stresses, additional stresses on track. But as you've said, there are instances where Norfolk Southern, as has been admitted in this record, uh, provides for internal tolerances. But that reach leads to the other point for why uh, this the, the overload condition is so important and why we have provided for a certain amount of, amount of latitude. An overloaded car that has to be pulled uh, from the through movement is extremely disruptive to the NS operations. That car has to be removed from the train. It may be moving on. It must be set aside. It requires the use of additional Norfolk Southern infrastructure and effort simply to relocate that car. It is incumbent upon the railroad to make decisions at best it can to ensure fluidity. So in that regard, the uh, internal tolerances that the uh, agricultural shippers have complained about are yet an additional safeguard, both for us and for them. It allows us, in certain circumstances, to evaluate the, the physical plant characteristics of our line and, being in, and decide whether or not we are in a position to continue to move that car, regardless of the fact that the shipper may have not exercised appropriate due diligence in loading the car in the first place. Could you explain, for, I guess from a business standpoint, why it makes more sense from your perspective for, to pull the car out of service, not just for the 24 hours to determine whether or not it it's, was loaded properly or at the correct weight originally, but once that's determined, why doesn't it make sense for the carrier to take care of the snow and ice just as they are taking care of their track? I mean, how is it, it, you know, it seems like there's a lot of administrative expense and delay in getting the, the car back into, into service if you're going to wait for at least five days. Well, two parts to that answer as well. The first one is, in many cases, shippers do not provide a certificate of loading. So we don't know when a car is presented to us and we detect that it's overloaded whether or not the shipper has undertaken due diligence in loading the car or not. And we're not and forensic scientists. And that's where scientists. the 24-hour clock kicks in that you give them the opportunity well, we, to Well, once we've that. detected the overload and the car has been placed and the shipper has been alerted that the car has been detected as overloaded, now what we provided for is a carve-out where they can ag actually establish that the car was loaded within established parameters. But in the vast majority of cases where we encounter this, it just so turns out that the shipper does not have a certificate of loading and as a result cannot prove that the car was not overloaded in the first case. In our experience, most overloaded cars that Norfolk Southern encounters are ones that in all likelihood were overloaded at, orange, at origin to begin with. You uh, talked about the inefficiencies associated with pulling out a car and uh, having to reload the car and uh, taking care of the overload problem. Has Norfolk Southern studied the, the cost it incurs, one has to deal with an overload car and is looking for a tariff that would just cover those costs as opposed to a tariff that was, say, uh, punitive or tried to encourage the shippers not to overload the car to begin with? No, I'm not aware that they have. I think that would be a very difficult and I think very circumstance dependent uh, situation. I think in many respects the overload conditions here are, are akin to uh, liquidated damages because it is impossible under the circumstances to state with particularity in every circumstance when a car, uh, what kinds of costs a car is subjected to uh, or the railroad is subjected to rather when it incurs an overload. We don't want overloaded cars on our railroad. That's not our objective here. We don't see this as a revenue opportunity by imposing these charges against shippers. That's not the purpose at all. The purpose is to encourage shippers to engage in responsible behavior when they load a car. They load a car. Some of these shippers use cars that they know have a tendency to become overweight in certain circumstances. Once that car becomes overweight to an extent where it exceeds our internal tolerances, that car simply cannot move. The car has to be removed, and it has to sit somewhere until the shipper takes appropriate steps. The tariff is, is basically uh, designed to address those kinds of situations. And 
in certain circumstances now is even more accommodating than it was before. But isn't this all somewhat speculative as you haven't identified any of the petitioner's costs actually being uh, pulled out of service for being overweight here in this case, as I understand it. Uh, how many times, for example, has these tariff provisions actually been uh, applied to the shippers? Or is this something that's uh, prospective? Well, I'm glad you asked that because one of the things that we looked at in response to, to this inquiry was how often agricultural shippers' cars are actually becoming overweight. Now, they, I think they answered the very same question for you, and the answer was they could find no times where it had. Our conclusion is why are these agricultural shippers so upset, and are they really engaging in any different behavior now under the new rules than they were before? When they load a car, they have to remove snow from it because these are top-loading cars that they're using in the first place, both tank cars and covered hoppers. But can't one assume that since the tariff has been in effect, even though they have not been given the call that their car is overweight due to snow and ice, some shippers probably proactively had tried to figure out what am I going to do and who am I going to contract with to d avoid all of these additional costs and fees. And so they've had to proactively probably contract with certain vendors. I think that's what... Right, the they have and they do, and, and that's not new under the new tariff provisions. This is something that shippers that encounter overloads have been doing for years. This is not, in other words, the implication that the new tariff is imposing new responsibilities on uh, shippers that have experienced overloads is simply not the case. Under the old tariff, the way that Norfolk Southern had interpreted that and shippers that had encountered overloads have understood that is that once an overload is detected, they have affirmative responsibilities to arrange for its overloading. That was the case before August 10th, 2010, and, and, and after as well. Quick question. Um, it goes to right, right. If, 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 the Vice Chairman's question. Um, there, there's obviously a, a big difference of opinion here about what the tariff meant prior to the new tariff coming in or the new provision. Um, and your, your statement is that weather has always been uh, considered uh, when there's an overload. So if, if you go through a snowstorm, they'll pull the, pull the car out if it's overloaded, uh, weather or whatever the reason is. Um, so is there any way we can at least firm that up here uh, today, especially um, not just with respect to you, but with respect to all the other carriers, you, you supplied in the record various tariffs, and you, you made the statement that those all uh, take weather into account. So I, I, I think it would be helpful if we could somehow firm that up today, that maybe either one party doesn't understand, or, or I, I just, I'm looking for a little bit more confirmation that your interpretation of the tariff is the way it's always been applied. Is there, I mean, I assume there's documentation of cars being pulled out of service due to weather. Yes, there, there is, and that's what I'm saying is that we are able on the basis of our experience to say that, yes, when a weather-related overload has occurred, that is exactly how we have carried things forward. The shipper has been notified. The shipper has made arrangements within a certain time frame to unload the excess lading in the car or do whatever was necessary to bring the car back into compliance. That has always been the case. The issue here is that the agricultural shippers that are coming in here are saying, no, that wasn't the case before. They don't know that because they never had any experience under the old tariff of encountering any overloads. I guess that's my biggest concern is if they haven't had any experience, maybe they don't uh, aren't following um, uh, what the tariff did in the past because it never occurred to them. So I'm, I'm just I just want to get it nailed down here that both sides are on the same page they with may respect be of to an that. Opinion that it doesn't mean that they may be of an opinion that it doesn't mean that, but they aren't in a position here to say that we haven't interpreted our tariff provisions that way in the past. All they can say is that they didn't have any experience with them. Other shippers have, and incidentally, those shippers are not here today. Those shippers who have experienced the overloading are primarily coal and coke shippers, or Open hopper car shippers? No, they're, they're shippers, as, as our record indicated here, the shippers that tend to have issues with this are the shippers that are using open top containers right. like gondolas or hoppers in which snow, ice, and water can accumulate, can percolate in in some cases with its chips or, or wood chips or whatever, and cause the car to become overloaded. Now, those shippers can exercise due diligence in a number of different ways, but they know when they use that kind of car that during certain types of conditions, simply loading the car to maximum is not an assurance that that car might not later become overloaded. 
unfounded due to weather conditions. And I don't think it's fair to say that they alone, that we alone bear the responsibility when they use a car and load it in a way that might ultimately expose it to an overload. Have they complained about that practice when they have the car pulled? They said, look, when we loaded this car, it was well below the maximum weight, and now because of rain and absorption of, uh, of, of water, they're now overweight and we can't control the weather. Have they complained about that? Well, I don't know about complaint, but I do understand that there were some misgivings, and that was the intention behind providing for additional uh, uh, leeway under the revised tariff. Uh, we already incur costs and risks associated with these overloaded cars, and I think in some respects this case is an example of no good deed going unpunished. <laughs> these particular shippers saying, we have an issue with this, us saying, we don't want to be obstinate, we would like to be flexible. In your case, because your, si your shippers that experience this, we will provide for additional accommodation for five days. Following up on the, following up on the accommodation issue, and flexibility issue, wouldn't it make more sense for Norfolk Southern to say, look, this car is overweight, and we have it at this yard, <clears throat> and then have a crew, because you have people right there who could clean the car, get rid of the ice, bring it back to a, a, a reasonable a legal weight, the prescribed weight, and then uh, bill the shipper for that service, as opposed to requiring the shipper to come down and un un unload it or contract with somebody. That seems to be less efficient than having your personnel who are right there get rid of the extra snow and ice. Well, that depends. I mean, um, certainly under the circumstances, there might be issues where there was an extraordinary event in the interest of keeping an entire train or entire yard moving. Mm -hmm. That may indeed happen. Part of the problem, of course, is when we're talking about overloads, we're talking about many overloads where the situation may have been caused by a, you know, overloading of the lading to begin with. And it would not be appropriate for us to simply go into a car and start pulling the contents out for the purpose of rectifying the situation. But I will add one other thing, and that is that under your standard, remember, it's whether or not our tariff is reasonable, not whether or not it's the most perfect or the preferred or that you couldn't find other more efficient solutions to the problem. Mm -hmm. okay. One more question. Um, it just seems I mean, it's possible here that, I don't know if this is working, uh, but there's a misunderstanding. Um, and the way I've looked at it, I, I went back and looked at old ICC cases, and it always seems like there's been these internal tolerances or some form of tolerance in place uh, to deal with weather. Um, and that's the way shippers and railroads have dealt with it over time. And is it your understanding that um, all of the railroads have uh, such tolerances in place to deal with this weather issue? We do not have complete understanding of what other railroads' tolerances are. We do know that with respect to interline moves, that as is reflected in the documents that were produced, mm -hmm. that there are internal tolerances, that these sure. are pretty much network-wide. And we know that the principal reason for these tolerances really is twofold, but the, the primary reason for them is to inf ensure fluidity of the system. If we simply eliminated these tolerances, I believe the railroad system would come to a screeching halt because we're talking about heavily loaded bulk commodities, and loading these cars is an inexact and imprecise science, even if you have scales available to you. So without these tolerances, uh, you have a much less efficient and much more overburdened railroad system. In fact, in the, uh, uh, one of the staff uh, pulled a case from 1909 where there was a tolerance involved, and the tolerance was in place uh, because the scales back then were, were so inaccurate, so you needed to have a little leeway. And also weather was mentioned in, in that case. So it seems like this has been going on for quite some time. Um, so thank you very much. Mr. Goldstein, you have uh, seven minutes, I believe, on rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there were a couple of uh, points raised in Mr. Wimbish's uh, presentation that uh, uh, I'd like to just mention briefly. First, uh, he was talking about uh, the burden of proof being upon the petitioners. Uh, this is a declaratory order proceeding. It's not a complaint. And my understanding is that in declaratory order proceeding, what uh, the board normally does is, is balance the positions of the parties. Uh, I'm not aware that, uh, that there is a uh, same strict burden of proof here uh, that, uh, that we normally see. But if there is any ambiguity involved in the tariff, 
and there's some suggestion that there is, then ambiguities normally are construed against the maker of the tariff. And if there's a problem here because there's some, something unclear about the tariff, it, it should be, uh, I guess, uh, debited to the NS position, not ours. Uh, there was a discussion about uh, safety and this being an important safety issue. And I guess moving an overloaded car can be. Of course, we have a basic difference with NS about the definition of overload. Uh, we don't think that if a car is loaded within limits and then somewhere along the line of movement for operating convenience, it's parked someplace, and now it snows, and the car now acquires 6,000 or 7,000 pounds of additional weight that puts it over the top. We don't think that's our fault, but the tariff makes it our fault, and that, that's one of our primary problems. Any objection to the first part of the tariff, which requires you to certify within 24 hours that it was not overloaded? We have no objection to a to uh, being required to stay within uh, the, the stenciled limits. If we are not within the stenciled limits when we load out the car and tender it, it's our problem. And is the 24-hour clock a problem? Are, are, um, able to get, are there enough, I guess... Are, are the smaller shippers, do they have access to that information readily I, if they need? I, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Mr. Wimbish said that, that they don't have uh, certifications, is that there's probably a, a break in the link of communication. Uh, the, the car is deemed overloaded uh, someplace in, in the middle of uh, uh, Illinois, and uh, it was loaded uh, someplace uh, in Iowa. And how does the information get back to the shipper? Uh, we don't know. Uh, I, uh, there was some discussion also of these internal tolerances. Uh, I, I had thought, frankly, that, that that would be the subject of our closed session, so I haven't mentioned them up until now. But they. I think the, the highly confidential matters were the actual numbers, not the concept. I, I believe, well, I, I thought it was both, but whatever. Uh, I, I think when we get to the actual numbers, uh, later on, you'll see that it's, it's not an insignificant issue. Uh, these are not, uh, you know, the, the ICC used to have tolerances of a quarter of a percent, if you read some of those old cases, uh, to, to deal with weights. We're not going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about altogether different numbers. Um, let me, let me ask you something with regard to that. Uh, hypothetically, if, if what NS is saying um, is correct, that weather has always been taken into account prior to this, um, and, um, and then they have these tolerances in place which are supposed to deal with, with weather. Now, if those numbers, those tolerances, are hypothetically a reasonable number and would take care of 98% of all weather-related issues, uh, wouldn't that uh, change the picture here and make their tariff uh, seem reasonable? Well, I don't know if it would make it seem reasonable. It certainly would change things. Um, the, uh, uh, they're called internal tolerances, and that's because the shippers don't know what they are. <laughs> so I don't know if the, sh if the shippers don't know what they are. I don't know how it can affect the shippers' behavior. Okay, but... I guess it seems to me like this situation, I, I'm, I'm not sure because I'm not a historian on, on railroads, has been going on for many years, whether it's always been out there. And what I'm concerned about here is that there's been a process in place with tolerances um, to deal with weather and that right now um, we're going to over – you're asking us basically to overturn a process that might have been in place for 100 years of dealing with weather, which is tolerances. And that, that makes me nervous. So I just, I just want to make sure that we're clear um, that uh, that's not an effective process. I don't think it is. And, and uh, I think the tolerances you're talking about, uh, you said you read in some old decisions, that means they were public. That means that shippers knew what they were. That's not the situation we're dealing with. But why would that be different if they were public or private? If they were public, um, I mean, the number, the weather, if it still affects it, uh, the tolerance would still be applied the same. 
Well, if they were if they were public, then shippers could know how much over the stenciled gross weight they could load a car and not run into a problem. Let me just say before the red light goes on, please, that other railroads don't follow the practice that NS does. We don't see any other railroad publishing a tariff that uses the words snow or ice. We don't see any other railroad telling the shipper that if they have to park the car, even a covered hopper car, nice flat top, have to park that car someplace, and then it snows on the car, that that's going to be considered an overload under any circumstances. Prior to bringing this case, did you talk with any other railroads with respect to this issue? Have you asked them whether or not weather could result in an overload pursuant to the tariffs that were presented to us in the record? We spoke at length with NS, and we spoke, to my knowledge, with one other railroad. And did that railroad say weather is not an issue? That railroad, excuse me, what that railroad does is when it sees snow accumulate on a car, after the car has been shipped in good order, that railroad delivers the car or knocks the snow off the top. We don't know which, but they don't make a point of it. Okay. Those are closed cars, right? Because you wouldn't be able to knock them off the top of an open car. Absolutely. And what do they do in the situation where it's an open car? I don't know. I suppose they just penalize the shipper. I don't know how you can offload frozen lading. Maybe NS thinks there's a way, but we don't know of a way to offload frozen lading. When it occurs in a covered hopper car, it has to wait until it thaws. So it's possible in that situation that they would pull the car out and penalize them? I would think so, but I don't know their tariffs that apply to the open cars. I've seen NS operation where they're unloading coal cars that are open cars, and it's frozen. They actually have a guy there with a sledgehammer picking some of that coal loose so they can get the coal out, especially on the bottom. That stuff does freeze at the bottom, and you can't send the car back with all that coal still in it. So they actually have a dangerous job, but they actually sometimes use sledgehammers to break the coal loose. So I was going to ask you one other question. Would it be reasonable that, you know, you know what the maximum the car can hold, it was supposed to hold, as I said, 283,000 pounds. If a car came in that was, say, 291,000 pounds, and there was no snow, the car is overloaded and should be corrected. If there is snow, you can make a judgment as to how thick the snow is and what the weight would be, and that would be a case where snow and ice was the cause. Could you distinguish between cars that are overloaded because they were overloaded and ones that have become overloaded because of snow and ice simply by observation? Well, yes, because the latter category are those cars that are shipped out clean, and then somewhere along the route of movement they accumulate snow and ice. And so I think it's a perfectly logical assumption that the snow and ice has nothing to do with the load in the car. And therefore the act of God, not the shipper's fault. Not the shipper's fault, that's correct. Okay. So we would have to, the railroad would have to charge God somehow or other to pay for the extra costs. Well, we're always paying God for extra costs, so maybe that works out. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. We'll now take a five-minute recess and proceed to an in-camera session. The broadcast of a portion of this argument will end now. Counsel, I guess what we're going to do now is clear the room of everyone except for the attorneys that signed the confidential protective order. Thank you. Thank you.